So thank you people for joining us. My name is Ryan Erke. I'm the Sustainability Facilitator at the College of St. Scholastica. We are preparing for the busing and biking session for our Art Resilience series. This is a series that's a partnership with um, University of Minnesota Duluth and St. Scholastica to talk about living resiliently and sustainably here in the Twin Ports region. Um, we'll get going in a moment or two as we're waiting for a couple more people to join. Um, and thank you so much for being here. If you have any questions, do you want to connect with us? Um, feel free to send a message in the chat. That's going to be the best way to communicate with Jana or myself during this session today. Well, we might as well get started. It's 3.05, Ryan. Yep, sounds good. Um, so, ah, thanks for attending, you're here. Okay, thanks again everyone for coming today. Uh, again, my name is Ryan Erke. I'm at the College of Saints, Alaska. I'm the Sustainability Facilitator. I'm here with Jonna Corpy as well, and we are hosting this fall. Uh, it's not fall yet, but it feels like it today. Uh, Art of Resilience Sustainably Speaker Series. And we're looking at what does it mean to be sustainable specifically here in the Twin Ports. And so we're inviting a series, our, our group of people um, every couple weeks to talk about different topics. And today we're gonna to be talking about busing and biking here in uh, the, the, the Duluth area and Superior area. Um, this is new for us kind of doing this group session. I just realized that I was thought I was sharing my screen and I'm not, but we're gonna do our best here. Um, we have a couple different speakers from the Duluth Transit Authority that are going to start out and talk with uh, us about busing here in the Twin Ports. And then after about a half an hour, we're going to switch over and talk about biking in the Twin Ports. Um, things that I'm thinking about as we're doing this session are, I um, want this to be pretty informal, a good just discussion about what's happening. Um, these are topics that I feel are important to us to not only um, figure out how to live a more sustainable life here in um, anywhere, but specifically we're looking to focus on uh, the Duluth and Superior area. I invite you all to connect with us over the chat. We'll be monitoring it. And um, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Jana quick to do our start our first session here, if you're ready, Jana. Sure. Um, like Ryan said, I'm Jonna Corpy, and I serve as the Sustainability Coordinator for the University of Minnesota Duluth. Um, so before we introduce our speakers, I just want to cover a few housekeeping topics. Oh, and this is Francis. Um, I apologize if he totally interrupts or totally distracts you. Actually, I don't apologize for that, but um, <laughs> he is here. He is my Zoom co-pilot. So um, we make it work from home. Um, so a couple of things. Today's webinar is being recorded. Um, we'll be able to share the link with you after the event is complete for your reference if you want to look back at questions or answers um, or share with other people that you think might be interested. Um, we also want you to participate in this webinar. So please use the chat function to ask questions or comments. There will be question and answer time immediately after each speaker. So if you think of a question at any point, please type it into the Q&A chat box and one of us will read it out loud during the question and answer session um, to get that in front of our folks that we have here today. Um, Ryan, do you wanna introduce the speakers? Yep, I can do that. Um, so I'm gonna have to apologize, Alita. I know you introduced the other person that was here with us today, but I'll introduce you, Alita, and then we will, um, uh, kind of go into that and then we'll probably introduce Brett and Chris later on here so but for the busing portion we have Alita Johnson she's from the Duluth Transit Authority and she is a sustainability coordinator and the director of information technology for DTA and um, I guess in the in the second part we'll have Chris Rourke and Brett Pence who are avid um, all-weather cyclists here in Duluth I believe you're all-weather we'll see how how far that goes on Brett's laughing a little bit but before we hand it off, off to Alita, I want in talking about busing, we want to uh, ask you to participate in a quick poll, which you should see on your screen. 
shortly here so we can get a sense of people's bus experience. And so hopefully it'll pop up here, Jana. I'll ask you for your, there it is. I see it at least. And we're just trying to get a sense of um, how often do you ride the bus? Have you ridden it before? And if so, how often? So you can click on that and submit. Panelist, you can participate too if you'd like. And then if John, I don't see when it's completed. So if you want to pop it up when it's, you want to show people kind of the results, maybe once or twice, 10 times. Yes. Every day that I need transportation and some no too. Cool. All right. With that, Alita, I think we'll hand it over to you and your uh, partner in crime there. Uh, hello, my name is Alita Johnson. I'm the director of IT at the Duluth Transit Authority. I'm going to touch on all of our, most of our technology and some up and coming technology, and then I'll hand it over to Jeff Dahlgren, our director of scheduling for route information. Um, we have had a major website redesign that included a trip planner, um, but we are now spinning that off into the transit app. Uh, transit app includes uh, Uber, Lyft. Um, it incorporates all of our routes. It has GPS locations where you can, it'll, uh, let you know where you are obviously and then you can type in where you want to go or you can just see when the next bus will be by by scrolling down um i we do have um cleaning services i'm skipping around a bunch here we do have a lot of cleaning services too involved at this time we have the for the covid safety and security we have the um well, i can tell you what it is the everclear pro texas system where we have two cleaners on full time now cleaning the uh, facilities and the fleet. Um, we have cameras and audio and video in every single bus. So we have safety measures and security measures on our fleet as well. And um, we, yeah, we, have, uh, we have started, we've begun front door boarding now. Uh, fares, uh, we have a brand new fare box system coming. It is not in yet, um, but we are beginning fares October 1st. So you will need to slide to ride um, with your student card. And I think that's about all I got for technology. Can you think of anything else? Um, no. We have fabulous phone operators, so you can call 722-SAVE or hopefully the data will be at your fingertips with your phones. Um, again, hopefully we can get the market on this transit app. We already are, we are on it right now with our Google Live Transit feed. So you can right now download the app and you can start scrolling and using it. And we appreciate any feedback you have. Okay, I'll talk a little bit about the routes. We have uh, 20 different routes and some of them might have uh, many variations. Uh, we have about 17 different schedules. Uh, some of the schedules, the hand schedules that will contain more than one route if they're on a common corridor. Um, we run just a little over, little over 2.1 million miles a year, and last year I believe we had about 2.6 million passengers. Um, the colleges make up a large part of our ridership. I would say that uh, close to a quarter of our ridership is uh, related to the college and to the UPASS programs. Um, I forget what our budget is a year, about 17 million. Mm -hmm. And what else we got here? Uh, we have uh, schedules in every one of our shelters. So if a passenger didn't know or have a, an, an iPhone to uh, look up the schedule, they can go to the uh, shelter and they can see what time the next bus is gonna be going by. Uh, we do have most or a lot of our routes do serve the colleges. Um, at uh, UMD, we have routes uh, six, uh, 11, 12, 13, um, 18, and 23. And uh, at uh, CSS, we have uh, routes 11, 12, and 18. Um, and we do serve both colleges, uh, of those colleges on the weekends also. Um, we do have specific routes for the uh, colleges. Uh, routes 18 and 23 uh, serve uh, many of the uh, student housing areas. Boulder Ridge, uh, Campus Park, 
Um, and Route 18 also does serve Scholastica. So if a student lives at one of those one of those locations, they have a, a transportation to the school. It's completely free with their their uh, passes. As long as they, I guess at UMD now, they have to opt in if they don't have so many credits. Um, what else? We did recently uh, install driver barriers for the driver's compartment to try to minimize the uh, risks to the driver um, from passengers uh, related to COVID-19. Um, and we feel that that was a, a, a big improvement for them. And we're going to give it a couple weeks so passengers get used to boarding through the front doors again and then we'll start collecting fares. And as Lita said, the buses are cleaned. We have two full-time employees that are cleaning the buses all day long, and they also are clean in the evening. Um, they have some pretty uh, spectacular uh, equipment that they're using with ionizing uh, the cleaner so that it gets underneath the seats and in on the hand railings and that type of a thing. Um, and we have had the buses tested and they've, they've uh, been given a, a high level of improvement by the state of Minnesota for their cleanliness after that cleaning. So um, I guess as for passengers, um, we would ask them to try to space out as much as possible in the bus. Uh, you are required to wear a mask on the bus. Uh, most of our drivers have masks that they can supply a passenger if they don't have a mask. Um, what else? Uh, did you want us to touch on the Proteras? Right now or later? Yeah, that'd be great. Can you talk okay. about those a little bit? Sure. Um, we have had our Proteras since 2016. And you want to well, explain what the Proteras are? Oh, okay. So the Proterra buses are a all-electric bus except for uh, the heat system. It's a diesel-fired heat system. Um, that it's only activated after it gets down below a certain temperature. The electric heat uses up more, more electricity than the uh, actual uh, drivetrain and when it gets cold out uh, the battery life is depleted quite a bit. The yeah. range can be cut in half. So we, we have an auxiliary heater that is used uh, that burns uh, diesel fuel that augments the electric heat and that kicks on I believe it's at around 30 or 40 degrees before that kicks in. Yeah. Um, the buses are completely, other than the heater, are completely electric and uh, we can get pretty decent range out of them. We, we have run them for over nine hours on one charge. Uh, most of the buses will, the Proteras will use, will send out in the morning, then they come back, they'll get charged in the midday and then they go back out again. That way we seem to get the most hours out of them. But it's, it's a really impressive uh, range that they have. Um, nine hours in one charge. Yeah, the optimal temperature for them we found so far with our Vericity application is 60 degrees. That's where we pretty much plateau. Um, but we've learned a lot with regen, with um, the hills, with flat, long range routes. So we, it's still a work in progress and we, we have been now utilizing them for pullouts. So morning pullouts and afternoon pullouts and then they come into the bus barn here and charge in the afternoons. But we're still learning as we go daily. So what I understand about, and like I said, I'm kind of new to this area of D Duluth and stuff, is that Duluth was one of the um, pioneers in using electric buses, especially in a cold weather climate. Is that correct? That is correct. That is yes. correct, yep. That's why we were selected. Mm -hmm. It was a bit, kind of a, a proving ground for that technology. A beta, so to speak, I suppose. Yeah, and there have been growing pains with, the, with those buses. Um, things that weren't a problem in other cities are a problem here. Um, some of it's related to the snow and then the, the uh, chemicals used on the roads getting into parts of the bus that really shouldn't be getting into. Um, Proterra has been working close with us to try to fix those issues. Um, but uh, like I said, there's been growing pains, but we're working through them the best we can. Another they, question came in um, asking if biodiesel is used in any of the buses. By LDSU is used in all the buses, yes. Not in the Proteras though. Yes, it is for the for the heaters. For the heaters, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think there's a mandate we have that you use a certain percent of biodiesel. It's Twenty percent in the summer and fifteen in the winter, I believe. Yeah. And they're having a heck of a time with the twenty percent right now. It's blowing something. I just talked with maintenance on it. They're 
they're not very excited about it. They're excited for the 15 to come back. Or maybe it's 10 in the winter. There's this uh, biodiesel, it has a lot of solvency and it does seem to, there's any, um, anything in the fuel system that could be affected by solvent, it dissolves it and it plugs up the filters. And so they, they have issues with that. Um, Another question I get um, a lot from students is, is really more basic and looking at the poll responses that we got with um, eight people saying that they've only ridden a city bus once or twice. Um, can you talk about like, where do you wait for the bus? Um, what happens if you miss your stop? What do you do? Um, those kinds of basic questions. Sure, we have, we have bus stops located along the routes, uh, usually, within every other block. Uh, some of them, the distances are a little bit longer. Some, some of them are closer, um, but if they just go down to, the, to where our bus route is and look for a bus stop, uh, we are going to be installing double-sided bus stops so that you can look in either direction down the road and see if, where the closest bus stop is. That's a work in progress also. Um, we have uh, our system map on our website, so if they don't know where the bus route is, they can look at that system map, map and see where the closest route is. We also have the schedules on there. Um, the question about uh, uh, if they miss their stop, you just pull the cord when you get close to your stop. If you miss a stop, just pull the cord again and the driver will stop at the next stop. Or you can say, you might be able to just tell the driver and the driver might stop uh, sooner than that to let the passenger off. Um, Our buses are also housed with 100% bike racks. So one point that Jeff made earlier was make sure that if you do load a bike onto the bike rack that when you do get off the bus to let the bus driver know you have to get your bike off the bus, just a friendly reminder since you're uh, leaving the bus from the rear. Yeah, the drivers don't remember who put a bike on or, or uh, so sometimes the passenger will get out the back door and if they don't go immediately, immediately up to the front of the bus, the bus driver drives away with their bicycle and they have to, to get it uh, from our lost and found later on. And we're also 100% uh, wheelchair accessible. Great. So a couple of the questions coming about, um, one was back, you talked about nine hours until recharge. So how does the nine hours until recharge range of the electric buses compared to the range of a traditional hybrid bus driven. And I'm guessing that is referencing, so if we're having a full fuel tank um, or like hybrid buses, does it take less time to, or yeah, I guess what's the range of those vehicles compared to the traditional or hybrid bus? Our traditional diesel powered bus can, can drive for over 24 hours. They could probably go a couple of days on a full tank of fuel. And we do have buses that leave our garage in the morning and are out there for 20 hours. Um, the uh, hybrids are the same. The hybrids don't need to be charged. They, the engine is a smaller engine, but it, it's running a generator on there that recharges the batteries. Um, initially, the hybrids were better fuel economy than our traditional bus, but the, the uh, advances they've made in, in diesel um, technology have made the hybrid uh, about the same as a regular diesel bus now. So there's not much advantage in using a hybrid bus as far as fuel savings. There could be for carbon, uh, I guess I'm not even sure about that either. I don't think so now with the yeah. area. Yeah, yeah so um, the uh, electric buses, if it's really cold out, the range might only be five or six hours. But um, I, I do believe that uh, we could do better than nine hours. We might be able to go 10 or even 11 if it was a day that was Prime. 60 degrees where yeah. we're not running the heater or running the air conditioner. I don't, what's our temperature? We don't even set them out if it's 25 degrees or below, right? Yeah, we do have a, well, it's, we've had them out below that. Yeah, for short um, pullouts. Yeah, we have found that even with the auxiliary heater in there, that there, it is still can get cold inside the bus. And it's mostly been at the driver's feet. So Proterra has been working with us to try to improve the heating uh, in the driver's compartment. We have a couple other about the electric stuff maybe and then we'll switch over. Um, how many electric buses and how many hybrid buses? And curious about, is there a plan to move to 100% clean public transportation for the city of Duluth? Uh, we have seven completely electric buses and the hybrids we've had what? We had eight, but I think 
We only are down to three, three or four. Three or four. Yeah. And then you have additional traditional buses. Diesels, yes, yes there yep. are the rest. So we have seventy-seven total. So. Mm -hmm. So about 67, 67. 60, 66 or sixty-seven diesel, diesel. powered, and uh, hybrids, and then the seven electric. Electric, yeah. Uh, I don't know what our plans are for the future. It depends on funding. Uh, diesel, I mean, electric bus are very expensive. Um, they are approximately a million dollars a piece, which is about over 50% higher than our diesel powered buses. Um, but they are making great advances in battery technology. And I believe that the range is going to be extended further in the future. So at some point, maybe we would look look at uh, having a larger percent of our fleet. One other issue with 100% electric fleet is that the charge time does cut into our, uh, we'd have to have two buses for every diesel powered bus. So if we went from having 76 buses to having to have uh, 130 buses, that would be pretty expensive. So I think they're going to be, I don't, I don't know that they'll ever be 100%. Mm -hmm. And the infrastructure that we have in the facility here is very expensive too. Yeah, and we, we actually, when we have all seven of them on the chargers, they, they do use a lot of electricity. Um, we had to have a special line come, come in here to uh, power that charging uh, system. Yeah, it's a whole set, different system than yeah. the, our existing system. Uh, another great question that's come in is kind of about route scheduling and how routes are set up. Um, so speaking about like running buses later on the weekend or having a more frequent loop, loop between CSS and UMD, is there a regular time that routes get reviewed and how do people participate in that um, planning process? We are going to be having a, what's called a compre comprehensive operational analysis in the very near future. And we are going to look at time spans of service and headways. Um, one of the, the issues that we struggle with is do we want to have coverage or do we want to have frequency? And if we want to have a, a expanded coverage of the city, um, we only have so many dollars and so many hours of service that we can afford and so that cuts into headways. If we want to have increased headways or increase the frequency, then we may have to look at uh, scaling back on the coverage. So it's, it's kind of a balancing act. Um, we don't have a whole lot of ridership late at night. Um, I believe we have about five hours of service after midnight between uh, three, three or four different uh, routes. And the ridership, um, I believe it's around 60 to 70 passengers after midnight. So when we're looking at passengers per hour, we get a lot more bang for the buck by adding in a more frequency in the day than having a later service although we do understand that there are people that re that need to have that uh, service at that time of the evening for their jobs. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a balancing act and we are going to be looking at uh, if we're doing the balancing act right or if we need to make some changes in the, in the near future. Um, we will be, the, the comprehensive operational analysis will be um, requesting information from our passengers and from people who don't even ride the bus on how we can improve things and what they would like to see. So there will be surveys. We will have public meetings where uh, public input can be provided for helping us make our decisions. And we recently just did the TDP two years ago yeah. and we did that same exact process where, where we had surveys. We, we were represented at UMD. We had a station there to interact with students and stuff, but this will kind of be the same process with uh, meetings for the public as well as more surveys yeah. and stuff. So hopefully they'll participate in that. And you mentioned that um, front door boarding has resumed. Are masks still required? Yes, they are. Yep, they we we, we require them. It's a it's a city mandate also. Yep. Yep. So um, yes, they st still are required. And as I said, if a passenger doesn't have a mask, uh, the the bus driver most likely will have one that they can provide to the passenger. We have one thing that we're not doing is we are not kicking people off the bus for not having masks. Uh, we don't want to have our drivers have that confrontation with a passenger. And uh, there was actually a, a French bus driver that was uh, 
was killed by the passengers when he tried to force them to wear a mask. And so we don't, we don't want anybody getting assaulted. We don't want to have fights on the bus. We're requesting that people wear them, but we're not going to, um, we're not going to kick somebody off the bus or have the police call or anything like that. It's just not worth it. So there's a number of other questions on here, and I don't know if we're going to be able to get to all of them today. This is like I mentioned earlier at this session, this is kind of our first trial of giving this, uh, this panel type discussion going. Um, what I gather from the other, the chat discussions and some of the Q and A's, people really, um, we got a lot of bus lovers here on this, on this uh, thread here. And so thank you so much for the work you're doing. Um, I think there's a desire like to figure out what, what do you know where is the desire for more aggressive climate action goals that's a question come up and what is what's really necessary to get you know get beyond kind of where we're at even recognizing that we're doing really great work and then some questions about like how does the maintenance cost compare to electric and diesel i want to be mindful that we want to kind of transition to the bus uh, the biking piece here but those are questions that i think we can follow up with some people directly afterwards um yeah. And so, but, uh, and I think as we do our next session um, in a couple weeks too, we'll kind of work on this format to make sure that we can have people feel like they're heard and get their questions going. But I want to thank Alita and Jeff at this point. If there's anything else, Alita or Jeff, that you want to say before we transition to biking, I'll hand it over to you for a, a, a couple moments here and then we'll kind of transition to the biking. But I'll, Alita and Jeff, feel free to have, if you want to address anything that just kind of popped up or um, if you want to say anything else that you really want to highlight about people getting connected with you. Well, there was a question about the maintenance cost. Our Proterras are all under warranty right now. So other than tires and uh, things like that, there really haven't been very many maintenance costs. Um, but at some point, they're not going to be under warranty and we will have to start, uh, and things are gonna be wearing out. But it's, it's, it's kind of comparing apples and oranges right now. It wouldn't be a fair comparison. But those Q and A's, you can definitely shoot those emails to us. We will fill them out, send them back, and then you can send them off to the participants. Great. Thank you so much for joining us today, Alita and Jeff, and I look forward to working with you in the future. Um, John, I yeah. saw you unmuted yourself. So I was like, maybe John has something to say. <laughs> <laughs> now I was just going to work uh, to do the quick transition. So since we're moving on to our next session, before we introduce our Next two speakers, I want to do our next poll question so they have a sense of um, our bike folks in the in the audience. So you should see a poll on your screen here. You can click for more than one. Yes, please click as many that apply to you. I should have put something on here about do you bike in all seasons because that is not something I do. I am definitely a fair weather biker. <laughs> Looks like we're just waiting for one more person maybe. All right, we'll finish her up. So it looks like the majority of people bike for fun or leisure or recreation. Um, but there's a couple people on the call that bike for transportation. I hope though that might be some of our panelists um, more than likely. Um, and then some people who want to get back into biking. So we've got a fair mix of folks on the call. So with that, um, we'll introduce our two speakers. Ryan, do you want to introduce our speakers? I feel like you've got a little bit better knowledge of them than I do. Yep, yep. So today, um, the two people, and I know there's other people on the um, on this conversation that are bikers too. So feel free to hop and chat if you really want to have your voice seen, and um, feel free to send us a message. We can put you on there as well. But we have Chris Rourke and Brett Pence. Um, I had an opportunity to talk to Chris for the first time this morning. We talked a little bit about his bike experience, and he's going to share some stuff. Um, They've got about 20 minutes, Chris and Brett, and, and I think, Chris, if you want to take the first 10 minutes and then Brett um, transition, but feel free to have conversations back and forth, and I'll uh, make sure to highlight some items that came up either in the chat or um, in our questions as well. But, Chris, I'll hand it over to you, and um, 
as we talked before, we talked just about stories about getting to bike, you know, getting into biking, especially for the community's sake and kind of what that looked like. And I think you're on mute now. So just give you a heads up on that. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, yeah, after talking, I figured, you know, there's probably interest or people who are already dabbling in bike commuting. So I won't uh, get into technical aspects of it. I think, like you said, stories and relatable um, scenarios are, are really the, the thing to share about bike commuting because uh, I was just kind of jotting down the highlights <clears throat> that that I get out of bike commuting and, and just thinking back about how I started and, and where, it, where it's taken me and, and sort of an un, unexpected way. Um, the, the beginning of it for me, like I told you, was um, I was sharing a car with two siblings in high school and, and I one day realized, you know, I don't have to wait for someone else to drive me around. I, it's, it had always been that way and in a in a suburban infrastructure, there's not really um, encouragement for riding your bike on the road. As, and it really, at first, kind of felt dangerous. So I thought, when's the best time to do this? And I decided, well, I'll start riding to school early before anybody else is even on the road. So one particular experience that sold me on it as I left, you know, I, I didn't have any lights or anything. I just waited for a sunrise and took off. And it was a foggy morning. And I remember just looking around me and there's no cars. All I could see was just a line in the fog behind me and thinking about how, how connected I was to this, to this pretty boring drive to high school. And, and then I arrived at high school, uh, started the day and realized how much more energy I had and how uh, excited I was just to share that story with somebody. And then it just kind of carried throughout the day and realized, you know, I, my brain was awake uh, I felt more connected to my transportation versus just the, you know, the standard 10, 20 minute drive, listening to the radio, listening to music. Uh, yeah, sort of the, that, that connection was what really stuck with me. And then um, later on moving uh, ahead after, after college and moving away, I, I thought, you know, I can try, I can take the same principle I moved away with as little as I could, you know, a couple of suitcases and my bike and was, you know, sleeping on uh, a floor and thought, you know, I'll figure out a job. Maybe I'll bring my car out here. And then as time went on, I just, just kept riding to work after I found a job, found a new commute, <clears throat> got to know the area and realized I don't need my car anymore. And that was it. Like after two months, I, threw out an arbitrary goal of riding for one full year without ever having to drive a car and uh, asked my friends to keep me honest, you know, keep me accountable. And after doing so, it just it became kind of the topic. Anytime I saw a friend of mine I hadn't seen in a while, they say, what's your, what's your streak today? And like, and it became just a, a lifestyle. And the things that came along with that that I thought were really great were something that I didn't anticipate was it just kind of, um, it was like a coincidental um, intentionality about, about a daily life. Uh, like we were saying, sometimes when you, you leave for the day, you pack what you need. And sometimes, and then after, you know, after so many repetitions, it, uh, everything else kind of seems like excess. So um, I know we're kind of digging into like the, the more like philosophical idea of commuting um, on a more basic note, it's just, it allows you to see the, the area around you in a better way, similar to being a passenger. I mean, if you're like, if you're riding in a bus, you can, you can look away, uh, or read, or just kind of think without having to really concentrate. Biking is, a, I think, a great pace for people to move. And when you're going through a new city, as Duluth is for me, uh, I've been, choosing different routes every time I go across town and I find a new route, I find a new road that's, you know, pretty, pretty empty of cars. And then I seek that road again and I've tried to find a different way to get to that same road. And I think that's uh, another thing we had talked about was 
um, making commuting accessible is is comfortable your your comfort with routes like the the repetition um, knowing what roads you feel comfortable on knowing what the traffic is like at what time of day um, and then getting down to uh, what you need or like to be visible to be safe um, yeah let's see any other do you have any uh yeah, well, that's a good start, Chris. I like what you did. You kind of shared some stuff similar to what we talked about earlier today. It's kind of like a mindset or kind of what you're looking to, you know, get out of your experience getting from one place to the other. Um, I might take this time to kind of hand it over to Brett here shortly, and um, then we can also just open it up for a conversation between the both of you two, if that's all right. Mm -hmm. Sure. Tell me to go ahead. Yeah, right. go for it, Brett. Chris, I thought that was awesome. And hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Brett Pence. Um, I work for Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light in town, which is an environmental, statewide environmental nonprofit. And um, I am a bike commuter. I am not as resilient and tough a bike commuter as Chris, because I am not a year-round um, bike commuter. And that is a tough thing. I, my, some of my questions for Chris in this will be about winter biking. So I hope we, we can get to that later, um, because uh, his partner, Jenny Yako has kind of convinced me that I might give it a try this year. So, um, so I want to dig into that a little bit. I, um, I have been bike commuting. I'm 50 years old. I've been bike commuting since I was 22. Um, I do it um, when I can. It doesn't always work for me to bike commute. But I found um, more and more, uh, particularly as I get older, that it's really a matter of priorities and planning. So if I plan out that I, I want to bike, it's usually something I can do. Um, so it's, it's been, um, really great for me. The first time I, I, um, bike, uh, I started bike commuting was in Taiwan when I was at English as a second language teacher there in 1992. And, uh, it was an incredibly, um, polluted place. The pictures you sometimes you see of China now or Shanghai, where it's just a brown smog. That's what Taichung, Taiwan was like in 1992. And I just did not want to contribute to that problem. Um, I wanted to. You know, and I also wanted to get some exercise. So it was a, it was a great, similar to Chris's story, it was a, just a great reframing of how I was going to go about my day and how intentional I was going to be in my life. And that's carried through, um, um, through my life um, as well. Um, I've been in Duluth since 2006, so 14 years. Um, I came here from Missoula, Montana. And uh, Missoula, Montana is uh, uh, up there on places, you know, friendly places for bike commuting. Um, when I came here, I noticed um, that there are a few hills <laughs> in this town. And so um, it is, a, I think Duluth is a really great place to bike. We, uh, I did post a, um, if you didn't see it in the chat, I did post the, uh, the map that you can find on the city website that shows where bike routes are. It'll show um, the bike routes are streets and then it'll have um, off-road off um, specific bike trails, paved and non-paved. So that's a really good resource um, that can get you up and around town um, safely. Um, I think it's best to approach Duluth with a sense of adventure as kind of Chris was alluding to. And you can see the hills as, a, um, as an obstacle or you can see them as an opportunity. Um, so I choose to see them as opportunity, but I'm realistic. I do, I have to say, I have some um, friends in town who are ex Olympic athletes that even sometimes they don't ride down the hill because they just don't want to ride back up. And so we have lots of options. If you fall into that category sometimes, um, the first thing I would say is take, take the bus back up. We already had a great discussion about the wonderful bus service we have here in town. You can put your bike on the bus and take the bus back up the hill. That's a great way to go in Duluth, I think, um, particularly if, you're, if that's what's stopping you from biking. Um, and we do have a great bus system. So I think that's great. Also, you're going to get in shape. You'll get kudos from anywhere else in the state if you say you're a bike commuter in Duluth. Um, you will get props from everyone. I know when I go to bike shops in the Twin Cities, they're like, oh, you're in Duluth, meaning you just got knocked up in respect. So it's a great way to get exercise, great way to get some street cred around the state. Um, and uh, just to be honest, we have some of the most beautiful bike trails in the state. We, we do have a... Um, not only our paved and our unpaved trails, but um, another good map, which I didn't post, would be from COGS, C-O-G-G-S. They 
Um, they are the partner of the city of Duluth that has built and kind of maintained all of our mountain bike trails in Duluth. And if you have a mountain bike, um, you know, you can take a mountain bike trail to work. You know, you can find out where trails are around there, take a mountain bike trail there and home, and um, you'll be amazed at what you see. Yesterday I saw a black bear when I was out mountain biking and um, you'll see something new every day. So I think Duluth is an adventure, is a place where you can, your everyday life can be an adventure and biking can be kind of a part of that. So I know we could get into more specific things and, but that might be my first stab at just a statement. I'll also say at the end that I, I also do have an electric bike, um, which I, which is what I use often for commuting a large cargo bike too. So that also helps a lot with the hills. Um, I'm really privileged to have that. That's not something everyone can do, but we, I can talk more about that if people have interest, so. Ryan, I wanna read Michaela's question because I had the same thought um, for uh, Chris. So Michaela wants to know what type of pack you use. Like what's your setup for biking and how do you, do you have any tips for reducing weight and making your ride easy? Definitely. Um, I have, I just use a backpack. I started off with just my school book bag um, to commute to work and it turned out that was a mistake because it was not waterproof. Um, so a waterproof backpack is ideal. Um, one that, one that fits. It took, it took me a while to find one that I really liked the fit of and I've used it for the past five years. And, and uh, yeah, something that can hold a, a spare change of clothes. I almost always have an extra pair of socks just because your feet might get wet. Um, I have extra extra set of lights just because, you know, I can forget to charge them sometimes. Um, I've also used uh, a rack and, pannier, and panniers before, like the, the bags on the back rack. Those are nice, especially in really hot months when you don't want to show up somewhere with back sweat, just shirt soaked through. Um, that and you can carry a little bit bulkier items and then you're using the the strength of the bike rather than your own rather than your own back um, yeah that's there are so many different ways to carry gear on your bike um, but the backpack for me from season to season is the most versatile um, but there are some really nice uh, bike specific ones that can carry a u-lock on the outside easily you know water bottle sort of your quick grab items, but then keep everything else, you know, like your laptop and clothes uh, dry, which is important. Cool, that's great. I don't know, Brett, do you have ideas about what you like to carry on your back or um, how you carry stuff around? Well, as Chris is talking, I looked over to, in my office here and I have my messenger bag from 17 years ago, I still use. <laughs> so uh, if you haven't heard of a messenger bag, there it's kind of a backpack, but it, it, it's uh, maybe a little more comfortable for riding depending on what you're doing. Um, I think Timbuktu still makes them um, as a company that makes really good kind of waterproof me uh, messenger bags. So um, yeah, I love, find something that works for you. I agree with all that Chris said. I'll just throw in the messenger bag too. So another question is, how did you find good bike routes and how do you avoid busy roads? Because usually those are the easiest to get to your destination, you know, the main, main veins and whatnot. Yeah, I'll start maybe on this one. Uh, I, first of all, check out that um, link that I sent out um, on the text. That's the city, the city map for the um, um, routes in Duluth. Duluth, since I moved here, Duluth has been constantly working on improving their bike routes. So it's really changed a lot in the last 14 years. So um, I can ride to down, I live at the top of Tisher Creek, so pretty close to UMD and St. Scholastica. And I can ride on pretty much on um, a separate bike trail almost all the way to downtown if I take the Lake Walk and uh, the Tisher Creek Connector Trail. And you can find those um, on the map. So. I look for, for, check out that map and really utilize the routes the city promotes. Also, when you find um, uh, roads that have bike lanes, I'm interested to hear what Chris thinks about that, but I find the bike lanes really do make a difference. I, I certainly feel more comfortable on roads that have bike lanes and I use Fourth Street is a really good example. That is my go-to um, street now where I go downtown and back if I'm not down on the, on the Lake Walk. So um, those are just a couple suggestions from me. Oh, and bike, 
bike shops also have maps, paper maps of bike. They used to have uh, paper maps of maps of bike routes in Duluth. Chris, you have anything to add to that? Yeah, um, one that's always been useful to me is simply just Google Maps. The the bike layering on the settings in Google Maps is brilliant. I mean, every city has a little bit of work to do on how accurate they are because sometimes I've followed a trail that I thought was a you know a mountain bike trail and turned into pedestrian only or something or you know a hiking trail, but. When you open up and you turn on that filter and you see solid green lines, it's like an immediate connection and you start to see that along with um, other little dashed lines. Those are, those are usually what I follow to start in a brand new city. And then, like I said, after, after trying those out, um, if they're too busy for my own comfort, I find something else. Even if it's a little bit out of the way, um, honestly, some days if I have extra time, it's just, for the scenery. Like I'll go up to Skyline just to ride across town because it's beautiful up there, even though it's a, like a, you know, first you get the big climb out of the way and then you have a little bit of a windy road. It's not super direct, but sometimes that's uh, just what the, what the mood calls for. And uh, yeah, and it's way more, way more serene and a lot less traffic in the weekdays. So yeah, Google Maps has, has been really helpful, especially mid ride. If I'm like, feeling lost and I don't know where to cross uh, a really busy road, then I pull it out, uh, pull my phone out and, and look it up right away. Cool. Um, another question. Um, this is a really interesting question. And I wonder if maybe Alita could weigh in, and in on this too. Um, what changes would you like to see in biking infrastructure in Duluth? And do you think more widespread adoption of electric bikes could spur Duluth to become a more bike friendly city? And the reason I, I say maybe Alita could hop in on this because other cities are adopting, you know, bike rental um, opportunities where people can check out bikes that just on certain major street areas. Um, I'm wondering if that's in any planning for like the downtown area or anything like that. Yep, at our multimodal facility, we did have one in there temporarily. I don't believe they're in there anymore, um, but it has been a discussion in the past. We've had several reach out to us and I mean, we, we have sidewalk space, we have bike storage, we have everything at our multimodal facility. So absolutely we would entertain any kind of offers or, or team teamwork with them. So back to Chris and Brett, what do you, what do you think, um, what kind of changes could there be in Duluth to make it a more bike friendly city? Chris, you wanna go ahead or you take it? Uh, yeah, it's good. it is a good question. Um, we often get caught just saying more bike lanes, but I don't think that's the right answer. Um, I think awareness of, um, or just, I, th I think what really helps is when a lot of people use a similar route, I think, because then more people are seen using it. It's either encouraging more people to ride it or it's recognized by people using that road as there are going to be bikes here. Like on a given day, you're going to be interacting with bikes. So like bike boulevards where you have uh, it's very clear signage that a bike might be taking this whole lane because that's what's the safest option. Um, along with that, smarter bike lanes in, in terms of um, not just a stripe because that gets covered up by snow in the winter time. And for those who do ride in the winter, a protected lane is brilliant because it's an actual barrier and it's something that gets um, intentionally maintained by cities in, in places that I've seen um, protected bike lanes. It's, uh, it's much more confidence inspiring for a winter commuter or I mean year round. If someone's new to it, they're going to feel much more comfortable interacting with traffic right alongside them. So um, that sort of thing, uh, utilizing one way streets, um, giving more space. I think those are improvements that could be made, but mostly uh, options of bike thoroughfare. So getting through, getting across busier, busier highway type streets, uh, I think is just a, a major step. Um, yeah, 
so not just not just more bike lanes but i think uh well placed bike lanes and um bike lanes designed by or at least given had the input of people who use them not just this this street could you this street could have one because we we need to um you know do maintenance on the street this year it has enough space we can put a bike lane that doesn't necessarily make it a good bike lane yeah i you know one thing that's this making me laugh a little bit because i think the question is um you know what would changes in bike infrastructure and what would you know what would a more bike friendly city look like i think the pandemic has made us a more bike friendly city in some ways so it's one of the positive things of the pandemic is traffic really went down particularly when we're talking in uh, in the springtime of this year um as people were locked in their houses and the city um closed off some streets to traffic to allow people to walk and recreate and people loved it and if you talk to people people have had a taste of that now i think they're going to ask for more and more of that so that's one thing we're going to i think i hope we'll see more of um i know that um seven bridges road and um uh, hawk ridge was one of the areas blocked off and i think anger tower was another and you people would purposely ride over there and just ride to recreate and see other people so i think this emergency as dire as it is is giving us a taste of what it could be like because i know a lot of people that are just biking a lot more now and enjoying it the bike shops are totally sold through all their bikes this year and um, electric bikes have become a huge seller in the in the country so um, i have seen a lot more electric bikes around town to address that question um, i think as the cost of electric bikes come down it will eventually help duluth because i know particularly as people get older and they're, um, you know, the hills do become more and more of a barrier. Um, and the electric bikes really do help with that quite a bit. It's quite, it's not intimidating at all, quite easy to bike up and down, uh, you know, bike back up with an electric bike. So um, a, a, a good quality basic electric bike is around 1500 right now. Um, that's down from about 2500 a couple years before that. So as we see those prices continue to come down to where they're, sort of in the 500 to a thousand dollar range i just think you'll see more and more of it but i i think we're seeing some of it right now and my plug for one simple thing that could be done in town would be just more bike racks i know um it's amazing they have all this we're doing bike lanes but i know i biked i, I think i biked to city hall for for work one day and i biked on you know fourth street and i got over there and there's no there wasn't a bike rack in front of city hall i had to kind of work behind city hall to find the rack so just more bike racks and making um, making sure that people have simple stuff like that available to them um, would be really helpful. Um, other tips for commuting in the winter time. Maybe this one's for Chris. Yeah. How do um, you do it? <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to my first Duluth winter commute, although uh, COVID has me working from home, so it's kind of unique. It's coming back to, um, I think actually a good approach um, is, you well, first finding out which, which clothing works. Um, you do stay a lot warmer than you think. Um, I, at least I thought so. I thought there's no way, no way I'm gonna get through. When I moved to Minneapolis uh, five years ago, I thought there's no way I'm gonna get through this negative, 20 degree weather riding and turns out it's more reliable than my car was so uh yeah figure out which clothing works finding um i think of different um sort of bailout options like what buses are going that way in case my bike breaks down because they do um checkpoints along the way i love stopping at coffee shops for a warm-up um you know if you have the time but yeah, figuring out gear is is kind of a daunting thing, and it takes some failures. I've stopped mid ride several times to you know warm my hands back up and get back on the bike. But um, those are keeping yourself comfortable is major. As soon as you're as you're if you're comfortable on a on a winter commute, you're much more likely to do it again. Um, and then gear obviously becomes a factor, like tires. Fat bike tires will get you through, you know, four or five inches of fresh snow. Um, studded tires will keep you upright on icy roads and notoriously bike lanes and bike paths are going to be icy spots. So 
studded tires are an investment, but you can use them winter after winter. I used one pair for three consecutive winters with, and using them daily before wearing them out. So there, uh, yeah, there are some expenses, but looking back to why, um, I mean, it's uh, it's kind of a sense of responsibility and reducing the amount of uh, time I spend driving and just, yeah, it's, it's surprisingly peaceful too. I would say that I've been with the temperature drop, I was kind of looking forward to, or just dreaming about the first time this year when, uh, when the roads are packed with snow and you can ride right down the middle and everybody's, you know, stayed, stayed at home and warm and you have the street to yourself. It's, it's pretty beautiful, honestly. <laughs> I don't know if that really helps as far as suggestions. And there are a lot of like individual things you can do. And I'm always happy to answer those questions. Um, but yeah, figuring out which, which clothing works for you, which you likely already have. If you have winter clothing, you can just wear it on the bike. You just have to be careful not to sweat too much. Well, I think what, so again, similar to the bike stuff, we've got a, we had a few other questions and stuff, but we wanted to be, we did probably put 4.15 as a time to wrap up, but we kind of said, well, we don't, similar to class, you know, for, whenever it's done, want to make sure people aren't chomping that, let me get out of here, let me get out of here. But I do, one of the things that I, I guess I want to bring up and provide an opportunity for each of our panelists to kind of share as we um, kind of closing thoughts are, um, both Chris and Alita in conversations, has similar ideas about supporting um, people who are new to busing or new to biking. And I'm curious if you wanted to take a, a moment or two to throw out an idea and if there's interest, like put that out there that I think Jana and myself um, could possibly help facilitate making stuff happen um, at our respective campuses, keeping in mind that things are requiring us to be resilient during times of COVID. Um, of how to do it. But Alita, I see you unmuted. Do you want to share a little bit about your, um, your idea about encouraging and helping other people try busing for the first time? Sure. Um, so I've been in transit for 16 years now. And um, when I first came here, I did not ride a bus. I was a very, very rural girl and it, it, I had fear factors. So um, one thing that I have always dreamt of with UMD or CSS or anything is just kind of, kind of to have that that student to student interaction where you can call somebody on the phone and say, I wanna learn how to ride the bus. And they meet you, teach you how to read a schedule, show you some technology, and then they do it with you. So, so they, can, they can load your bike on the bus. They can show you how to use the fare box. You can travel to and fro locations. So if you wanna to go to the mall and come back, um, just to make it kind of easy and, and, and show you that it, it is really easy. You just, just gotta take the fear out of it. So that was one of my thought processes. If we could partner with somebody or some, team and and just create a comfortable atmosphere for the students. And Chris, I think is maybe, are you there still? I was wondering if you froze up there for a second, but I think you had some similar ideas too as we were talking this morning. I was just uh, typing an answer, so I probably looked <laughs> a little stoic. Um, yeah, I had thought of this idea moving here, like, like we we're, we were discussing um, finding out which route, which routes work for you. Um, I thought if I were new to a city and I wasn't confident, um, in bike commuting year round, I would, I would want to network, um, and, and this, and the, um, cycling and especially the commuter world is a great resource. So like you talk to anybody who's riding their bike and they're going to have a thousand different examples of what works for them and what doesn't, but, um, the confidence of riding, is really what makes it possible. And I think by utilizing the network we have, um, I would personally love to, if someone would reach out to me and say, I would love to ride this, um, this distance from my house to my job, but I'm worried about this section. Like, do you have any advice? I can happily give that advice or also I'd be willing to ride it with you, you know? Like having someone side by side, to, um, you know, check for traffic. It, it's, it was one of my joys of commuting to work was running into a coworker and just kind of relaxing and talking on the way in. It's such a, such a personal, uh, it's such a good relationship building activity. 
And I think that's what we need in, um, I mean, in a growing city, uh, positive relationships like that. So I, I was saying personally, I would offer if anybody wanted to feel more confident about their commute, I would ride along with them, uh, help them find a good route, whatever works for them. And that way, um, maybe they know, maybe I'll know somebody who's coincidentally going that way as well and say, you should buddy up with this commuter and, and uh, share that route together. And I think that's something I would look forward to. Chris, would it be all right if we share your contact information in a follow-up email and then if anybody wants to reach out, they can? Absolutely, yeah. Wonderful. And I just wanna acknowledge Jenna, I am not ignoring your questions, but they are in-depth uh, questions and I don't know that we have the, the time or capacity to answer those questions right now, um, but they're very good questions. <laughs> um, one other thing that um, I want to address because I know that there are some people that haven't ridden city buses a lot and I just want to share some personal experience riding the bus um, here in Duluth. I've ridden the bus in many, many cities. Um, I really learned how to ride the bus in Seattle and that's huge commuting city lots of bus ridership, lots of people crammed together. And um, Duluth in comparison is one of the safest, cleanest, most reliable bus service services that I've utilized. So I just wanted to, to put that out, for, out there for people who might be a little bit nervous about riding the bus. Every bus driver I've interacted with has been very kind and open and answers questions very well. And so if you get stuck on the bus and you've past the route and you're, you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't even realize, and you're at the end of the route and the bus is turning around, just let the bus driver know. Um, you know, they're, they're very, um, very kind and very helpful um, when you're trying to find where you're going, if you've missed your stop, if you're trying to catch another bus. Um, so just be willing to put yourself out there and, and start doing it. Um, you know, just like Chris was saying, be confident in, in doing what you are trying to do. So whether that's riding your bike or riding the bus, um, I think it's really important to just get out there and start doing it. And um, it's this is a really safe place to learn how to ride the bus. That's what I really want to share. Yeah, I do appreciate that. Uh, our, our bus operators, I mean, we feel we have a really good team here between information operators, uh, bus operators, you know, even calling into customer care and stuff like that, um, customer service our drivers are top notch. They are so good at what they do and they are informational and they are helpful. So please do talk to them and, and make sure that they know, you know, where you want to go and how to get you there safely. So thank you for that. Yeah, I think um, Gianna and there are panelists. I want to extend thanks to everyone for attending here our session today. Um, I'll, put our contact information up for those of you who don't have, uh, haven't connected with us. There's been some great questions that we didn't connect with um, that are on there, some that were more in depth. I, I did watch um, the Twin Ports climate conversation about multimodal travel. I'm sharing my screen now, so I won't put that up there, but a follow up if you wanna check out some more information, especially around the planning, there's a conversation that's available on YouTube, uh, the Twin Ports um, climate conversation that took place this summer regarding um, different forms of transport in Duluth that are uh, climate friendly or potential for climate friendly are really was a really great session really focusing on planning and highlighting both Duluth and Superior and bringing in some consultants from Madison as well. Um, we are going to have another uh, Art of Resilience coming up in two weeks, a Wednesday the 23rd. It's going to be focusing on composting and food waste management. And that'll feature um, a representative or multiple representatives from um, WW, uh, WL, L, WLSSD, sorry about that, the Western Lake Superior Sanitary District, as well as Ellen Sandbeck, who is a vermicomposting or worm composting expert. And then we have a representative from Vermont, which recently uh, banned uh, all organics or food waste from going into the residential or commercial trash. And so that would be a session that will be held on the 23rd of um, September at the same time, 3 p.m. Um, you can connect with that if you're interested. And then we are working on our October schedule. We have three kind of in the works, and but we plan on doing stuff in November 
in probably December too. If you have topics you want to connect with, or if you want to delve in deeper with biking or busing or other forms of transportation, we're really trying to offer an opportunity to explain and expand on just conversations around what it means to be both resilient, you know, especially during this time, I think that's becoming more and more something of focus of trying to figure out how do you navigate when things are going awry, but at the same time, not giving up our commitment to um, sustainability, commitment to justice, commitment to health of ourselves, our ecosystems and our neighbors. And so that's really what our, we're trying to do with this session. This was our first one. So any technical stuff that you see that you are expert in, come join us and help us um, kind of facilitate a stronger session that really allows us to connect with each other and support each other. Um, John and Francis, um, I hand it off to you if you have any other things you want to say before we head out and sign off today. Oh, I just want to extend my thanks to Chris and Brett and Alita um, for joining us and for everybody that attended today. Um, and do please reach out um, if you have simple questions for the um, any attendees, um, email us or connect with us on social media and we're happy to answer more in-depth individual questions and connect you with other resources as he did. So with that, we will bid you all adieu for the afternoon and have a great rest of your day. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank Bye. you.